Kita sudah sampai di Ngadi Rejo, Kecamatan Soko Dan kita sudah mendekati lokasi yang kita tunggu Oke, okay, mari langsung kita ikuti jalan kita Oke, okay, ayo Saksi, saya akan berbagi Ini Bapak Saksi itu ikut di sini Namanya Pak Saksi Asli Pas Kas Bapak Dodo itu rumahnya di Pemanggaraya Ini termasuk sampai yang bubar di Bapak Rokok Tadi sampai cepat di Jumlah Pak Kas Bapak Dodo itu Jumlah yang akan Pak Dodo Okay, 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 we're right 
as our agenda will commence shortly. We also would like to remind all participants to make sure their mobile phones are either turned to silent or switched off during the agenda. Thank you. Distinguished guests, beloved lecturers, students of University Darussalam Gonto, the Fountain of Wisdom, it is our great privilege and pleasure in welcoming you all to today's proceedings. Greetings. It is our distinct honour in welcoming His Excellency, the British Ambassador to Indonesia, Asian and Timor-Leste, Muazzam Mali. The Honourable Paul Smith, the Director of British Council of Indonesia. The Honourable Rector of University of Darussalam Gonto, Professor Dr. Amal Fatullah Zakashi, MA and to all of our beloved lecturers. Let us begin today's agenda with the reciting of the Basmala. We now invite to the stage Brother Atto Hawari for the recitation of the Holy Quran from Surah Yusuf, verse 1 to 7. Recitation of the Holy Quran from Surah Yusuf, verse 1 to 7. Recitation of the Holy Quran from Surah Yusuf, verse 1 to 7. The Holy Quran from Surah Yusuf, verse 1 to 7.
Sanal Qasasi Bima Awhayna Ilaik Bima Awhayna
Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the national anthem of Indonesia, Indonesia Raya, which will be followed by the national anthem for Great Britain. Thank you.
Thank you. You may now take your seat. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now our great honor to welcome the Rector of University of Darussalam Gonto, Professor Dr. Amal Fatullah Zakashi, for the official opening of today's agenda. Honorable His Excellency Muazzam Malik, British Ambassador to Indonesia, ASEAN and Timor Leste, Honorable Mr. Paul Smith, Director of British Council for Indonesia, Honorable the Head of Board of Treasure, Distinguished Guest, Lecturer of UNIDA, and my beloved student. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillah, wabi nikmatihi tatimu solihat, wabi kudratihi tazulu sayyat, wasyadu alla ila ila ula wahdaula syarikalah, wasyadu anna Muhammad dan Abdu wa Rasuluh amma ba'du. First of all, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to His Excellency Muazzam Malik, British Ambassador of Indonesia, ASEAN and Timor Leste, to University of Darussalam Kontor, the fountain of wisdom. We say, ahlan wa sahlan wa marhaban, and make yourself at home. It is great honor for me, personality, and our institution, University of Darussalam Kontor, to host a public lecture on Islam Education and United Kingdom by the Excellency Muazzam Malik, British Ambassador to Indonesia, ASEAN and Timor Leste. Mr. Ambassador, I am pleased to inform you that in this university we have two lecturers who are graduate from the University of UK. The first, Mr. Akrim Mariat, now still in Kantor. He is graduate from the Manchester University. Currently, he is the head of road, uh, head of board of treasure in this university. And we also have Dr. Hamid Fahmi Zarkasi, who took his Master of Philosophy at Birmingham University. Now, he is the vice rector of Academy Affair. And we also have three... <laughs> And we also have three lecturers who have joined FOIAT for the understanding with this started in UK using Prince William Talkswick. Uh, you must know the director of British Council is the same alma mater for Dr. Hamid from Birmingham. <laughs> so they are very close. And currently, we have one of our graduates admitted to University of Birmingham. His name is Ricky Faldi, and will start study in Birmingham, inshallah, in September, in, when, in this year. <laughs> Mr. Ambassador, I would like to extend my graduate gratitude to you for trusting our university to host this public lecture. This is our university. The university is based on the five spirit, sincerely, modesty, self-sufficiency, Islamic brotherhood, and freedom. And our motto, noble character, son body, broad knowledge, and the independent mind. The founding father of Gontor educated the spirit of Boto to us, and now is our turn to educate it, our student with this spirit and this motto. The main feature of the university, in the first place, it is work of institution. That means it is no longer that the property of the many 
in individual or certain social organization, but it is belong to Muslim society in this world. In addition, the university run under modern Pesantren system. It employs hard boarding system where students and lecturer have the opportunity to live in the campus site and explore their creativity in the design wisdom based environment of the Pesantren. And now the University of Darussalam established in 1963 Currently, we have seven faculties. Faculty of Education, Faculty of Sulutin, or Theology, Faculty of Sharia, Islamic Law, Faculty of Economy and Management, Faculty of Science and Technology, Faculty of Humanity, and last, Faculty of Health Science. In the future, we hope that our university will play more important a rule of the world class university. And I believe one of the door to reach the dream is by having more children study in UK and bringing, <clears throat> and bringing back the help study and develop this university. And inshallah, with the support of Mr. Ambassador, the door of UK is wide open for us. <laughs> Mr. Ambassador, again, we are very happy with your visit and we, didn't, we did our best to make this visit successful. However, please allow me to be part of our shortcoming in uh, shortcoming our reception. Finally, please keep the name of University of Darussalam Gontor in your dua. Please pray for Allah. Will Allah bless our university uh, and guide to everyone in the university? Thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Ladies and gentlemen, Muazzam Malik is the British ambassador to Indonesia, ASEAN and Timor-Leste. He took up his post in October 2014. Prior to his appointment as ambassador, Muazzam was acting director general in the UK Department for International Development. He oversaw the UK's engagement in the Middle East, Western Asia and led the UK relationship with multilateral organisations. Prior to moving to Jakarta, Muazzam sat on the advisory board to the UK All-Party Parliamentary Group on Conflict. He was a member of the UN Secretary-General Advisory Group on the Central Emergency Revolving Fund and working to eradicate child labour from the South Asian rug industry. Muazzam is a graduate of the London School of Economics, holds a master's degree from Oxford University and a Chartered Diploma in Accounting and Finance from the ACCA. And lastly, Your Excellency, and by no means last, like myself and many students in UNIDA, he is also a Liverpool Football Club supporter. <laughs> so, please join me in giving him a warm welcome to the podium, His Excellency Muazzam Malik, the British Ambassador to Indonesia. <laughs> Professor Amal, Rector yang terhormat. <laughs> Dr. Hamid, Dr. Maskon, yang saya hormati, para dosen 
para mahasiswa. Selamat sore, salam sejahtera bagi kita semua. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Pertama-tama saya ingin mengucapkan saya sangat berterima kasih atas undangan hari ini untuk berkunjung ke Gontor dan memberi kuliah umum. Sebenarnya saya berminat sudah lama untuk berkunjung ke Gontor karena ini salah satu Indonesia tidak hanya lembaga pendidikan tetapi salah satu lembaga Indonesia yang ternama, yang terkenal, yang punya peran yang sangat penting. Yang punya peran yang sangat penting untuk masa depan Indonesia dan saya berpikir untuk masa depan seluruh dunia. Jadi alhamdulillah hari ini sempat berkunjung ke Gontor dan Universitas Darussalam. Kedua-duanya saya ingin mengucapkan saya sangat bangga. I saw many women naik sepeda motor pakai jilbab. <laughs> right? I saw many women riding motorbikes wearing jilbab. For you guys, it is something irrelevant. Maybe you've never thought of it. But I tell you, I have never seen such a thing anywhere in the world. Well, I've traveled in South Asia, I've traveled in the Middle East, I've worked all over the world. But I never saw women wearing headscarves, riding motorcycles. So I pulled out my camera and I took a photo and I sent it to my daughters. I sent it to my daughters back in London through WhatsApp. And my message to them was, look at this. Be inspired. This is something different. <laughs> And the inspiration continued. So in my first month, in my first Ramadan, my first Bulan Puasa in Jakarta, I was invited to the Istana for uh, an Achara Nazlul Quran. And we are sitting with the President and the Vice President and uh, the Minister of Religious Affairs, Pa Lukman, and many other friends in government, the leaders of Muhammadiyah and NU and Pangusaha and Orang Orang Panting. <laughs> and the Talawate Quran, the Pambacha An Quran that is given for this function, is given by a female ulama. And I'm sitting there thinking, does no one get it? This is different. But everybody is santai saja. You know, they're all relaxed. This is something normal. But if I were to go to my local mosque in London, the mosque that my father was involved in the founding of in the early 1970s, and if I was to suggest in my mosque Let's have a function where a female ulama gives the talawat e quran They would first laugh, second tell me I'm crazy, and third chase me out of the room. <laughs> In my second Ramadan, I was with my family, my daughters were with me, my son was with me, and we were going past Masjid Chut Mutia, one of the oldest mosques in Jakarta. And in the courtyard of the mosque, was a Ramadan jazz festival. Very interesting. So we got out, we went in and we had a look. And there were people singing, men, women, pakai jilbab, without jilbab, singing about the glory of God. Yes, they were playing guitar and using the saxophone. They were not singing about sex, drug and drugs and rock and roll. <laughs> But families were there with their children. People were sitting, nongkrong. You know, it was an amazing experience. And then in January this year, I went back to the UK for a two week tour. And I went around the country. I went in the space of two weeks, I went to London, to Leeds, to Bradford, 
Huddersfield to Edinburgh, Coventry, Birmingham, and of course, Liverpool. <laughs> and in Birmingham, I went to the Central Mosque. Dr. Hamid will remember it. Perhaps Pa Paul has visited it. So Birmingham is our second largest city in the UK. Our second largest city. 30% of the population is Muslim. 30%. 200 mosques in the city. And I met, I was greeted by the leaders of the mosque, the central mosque in, in Birmingham. I had the vice chair of the mosque. I had the vice chair of the trustees. I had an administrator and a young volunteer. And we sat and I told them about Indonesia. And I told them my story about Chutmuti al Masjid. The vice administrator to my left, Diam Sajjah, he doesn't know what to say. The vice chairman of the mosque, he's very interested. He's an elderly gentleman, maybe in his 50s. And he says to me, I cannot stop the children of my community going to the nightclubs. I cannot stop the children of my community going to the nightclubs. But maybe, he says, if I had a jazz festival in, in the masjid, maybe my kids would come here. The young volunteer, maybe in his 20s, he's almost jumping out of his chair. He's very excited. He's never heard such a story before. In a mosque. And the elderly gentleman to my right, the vice chair of the trustees, He's shaking his head. Bidda, he says. Bidda. <laughs> and what these stories show, because I'm not an ulama. Okay, I'm not an ulama. I'm a, I'm a Muslim, but you know, I'm an Orang Biasa, Pajabat. But what these stories show is that there are interesting things happening in Indonesia that the world <laughs> needs to know about. It's not for me to judge whether it is right or wrong for women to be on a motorbike riding, riding a motorbike wearing a scarf. It is not for me to judge whether it is right or wrong to have a Ramadan jazz festival and to sing about the glory of God. But the point is that your stories and what is going on in this country can inspire communities around the world to work out what it means to be modern and Muslim. What it means to be modern and Muslim. What it means to live in a diverse environment whether you are a minority, as in the UK, or in the diversity of Indonesia, what it means to live in a democratic setting where Muslims and non-Muslims, and Javanese and non-Javanese, or people like me, Katurunan Pakistan, or people like Pa Paul, a Brahmi, have the equal rights and have the same rights and deserve the same opportunities in life. So there is much that we can learn from you. But that world that I described that was knocking on your, that, 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 that feeling that I had, that Indonesia would look different, whilst it is true, the world does look slightly different from Indonesia. And there is hope, and there is aspiration, and opportunity, and interesting things happening. The world is still the same. The globe is the same. It is spinning on the same axis. And the world is knocking at your door. So some of the things that had, after 15 years, led me to be tired and in need of a change, they're knocking on Indonesia's door. Last year, we had an attack a mile and a half from where I live in central Jakarta. Yesterday evening, we were in Kampung Inggris in Pare. Just a few weeks ago, a few days ago, Densus 88 arrested somebody there on suspicion of terrorism, just down the road from you guys here. And it's not just on issues of extremism, but in other areas too that the world is knocking. Indonesia today is the world's 16th largest economy, but you produce the world's fifth largest emissions of greenhouse gases. In the next 10 years, Indonesia will become one of the world's top 10 economies. Maybe in the next 15 years, we will took our position, because today we are the fifth. Maybe in 10 or 15 years, you will be the fifth. Right? But as you make that journey from number 16 to top 10 to maybe top 5, 
unless you sort out your greenhouse emissions, you're going to set the planet on fire. And the people who will suffer the most are not people somewhere else, but they are people right here in Indonesia. Because this is a country that is vulnerable to climate change and to natural disasters. So it will be your people that will suffer. So whether it is extremism, whether it is climate change, whether it is bird flu, whether it is war in the Middle East, whatever issue that we look at, Indonesia is not immune. It's knocking at your door. And so one of the big lessons for me from my working life is that no country, no matter how rich, no matter how powerful, not Russia, not China, not the US, not the UK, none of us are powerful enough, are strong enough, are rich enough to solve the big international problems of today standing on our own. And actually, the history of the last 15 years shows us that the Western countries of the world are actually not able to solve the world's problems on their own either. And so as the world comes knocking on Indonesia's doors, as those problems begin to knock on your door and risk destabilizing your potential and your future, I believe Indonesia has an important role to play, a critical role to play in stepping up and working with countries like the UK to try and tackle those problems, those challenges, and to protect our common prosperity and our common security. So today, Indonesia is 250 million people. You are the world's third largest democracy, the world's fourth largest country by population. You're the 16th largest economy. You will be a top 10 in the next 10 years. You are 40% of the ASEAN region. You're a G20 country, and you're the fifth largest emitter of greenhouse gases, and you have the world's largest Muslim population. You have enormous potential, but you also have enormous responsibility. So to achieve your potential and to exercise your responsibility, I believe there are two critical things. There are many critical things, actually, but I would like to talk about two critical things today. The first is education, and the second is collaboration in, in, in uh, religious cooperation. On education, Indonesia is blessed with amazing natural resources and a geostrategic location. But actually, Indonesia's future, whether you become a top 10 economy or number seven, eight, or nine, actually, I believe, depends on higher education and the quality of your education, the quality of your sumberdaya manusia. And Indonesia has been very successful at raising the average. So school enrollment is very high. Literacy is very high. But actually, the truth is that the quality is very poor. So today, Indonesia does not have a university in the top 400 in the world. That's not good enough. That's not good enough. Right? If Indonesia wants to achieve its potential, that's not good enough for Indonesia's young people. So in the higher education area, working with the British Council, our offer to you is send your brightest and best to study in some of the best universities in the world in the UK. We have a higher education system that is amazing, more amazing than you would expect given the size of our country. We have four of the world's best 10 universities, 20 of the world's best 100 universities. And we're open. So one out of six students in the UK higher education system is actually from outside the UK. They're foreign students. They're from all over the world. And one out of four, docent, docent, and paneliti, our researchers and our, our academics, are also from outside the country. So the world's talent is coming to the UK to study and benefit from the quality of the education that we have to offer. So in this very famous LPDP scheme that you will know about, 35 to 40% of the students who are funded by LPDP to go and study abroad 
choose the UK because they've done their homework. They're Orang Chardas. They, they've done their homework. They know what's going on. And they know that the UK offers education that is luar biasa, berkualitas. But they know also that the UK offers a very strong all-round experience. Because if you go and study in the UK, you meet the world, because the world is coming there to study. But you also get to enjoy the sepa bola and the music and all the other fun things that we have in the UK. Because education is not just what happens in the classroom, but actually it is the experience outside the classroom that is also very, very important. That's our first offer. Our second offer is to invite British universities to come to Indonesia and to build partnerships with Indonesian universities to offer joint degrees, to do joint research, to exchange academics, to exchange students, so that we can support Indonesia's universities to accelerate their journey and become better quickly, because that is what Indonesia needs. Because no matter how many students go to the UK, the vast, vast majority of Indonesia students will be studying right here in Indonesia. So we hope that through those sorts of partnerships, we can help Indonesia to raise the quality of its higher education. And our third offer, which is very important in the education area, is Bahasa Inggris. Because Bahasa Inggris has become actually critical for success. This is not like learning a language. Bahasa Inggris is no longer my language, actually. It's, it's the language of the world. It's the, world, it's the language that is used in, the, in, in business, it is used in higher education, it is used in research, it is used in culture, in film, in music. I mean, it is, it is the global language. So if Indonesia wants to achieve that potential that I talked about, if Indonesia wants to exercise its responsibility, it has to be able to communicate. And the truth is, the world is not going to learn Bahasa Indonesia. I'm interested in learning Bahasa Indonesia because it's kunci untuk kebudayaan Indonesia. But the world is not going to learn Bahasa Indonesia. You have to learn Bahasa Ingres. And so, at Kampung Ingres last night, and in other work that we are doing, Paul and I are looking at how we can raise awareness of the need to speak English, to develop English as a critical 21st century skill. So education is a critical bidang kooperasi, bidang kerjasama for my embassy. And then, this issue of extremism, the religious cooperation, the second issue that I wanted to discuss a little bit. I already told you, Indonesia is rather special, I think, in this area. And compared to every other country that I've worked in and lived in, Indonesia is more successful in controlling the risk of extremism than any other country. Okay. So from the, in the UK, we have 3 million Muslims, 5% of our population. And from those 3 million Muslims, we estimate about 800 have joined ISIS, Daesh, in Syria and the Middle East. In Indonesia, the estimates of the government are about the same, 800 Indonesians. But of course, it is 800 Indonesians from 220 million Muslims. So Indonesia is more successful. It's not immune. We saw the attack in Jakarta. The police is busy disrupting extremist elements. Harus waspada. You have to be vigilant. We need our leaders to step up. But the world can also learn from what is going on in Indonesia. So my embassy is trying to look at how we can build links, cooperation, collaboration, between British Muslim organizations, colleges, community groups, and others, and Indonesian Muslim institutions. The British Muslim community is still a very young community. We are first generation, second generation, maybe third generation. And so the links with our countries of origin are very strong. But if you look at the ethnic makeup of this community, the links are to Pakistan, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Somalia, Yemen, Syria, and so on. And if you look at what's going on in those countries, you see conflict, you see extremism, you see poverty, you see all sorts of challenges. And so by trying to build links with Indonesia, what I'm hoping we can do 
is to share that inspiration that I felt when I was in Jogja or I was in the Astana or that I was saw when I was at Chutmutia Masjid, to share that inspiration, to pose the right questions. So my purpose in coming to Universitas Dar es Salaam or going to Gontor this afternoon or in uh, Lorboya this morning or uh, yesterday uh, when we were in Al Hikam in, in Malang or other Pisan friends I visited around the country is to say, please, focus, don't only focus inside your buildings. Don't only focus on your own community. The world is knocking at your door. Lift your eyes, see the world, engage with the world, and work with us to protect your own future, but also to help us build our future from your experience. And secondly, to remind them of the need for leadership to maintain that trajectory and that success that Indonesia has. Because we cannot be complacent. You know, even in these last few weeks in Indonesia, we have seen voices arguing that Muslims cannot vote for a non-Muslim. This is Barbahai Yaskari. This is a very, very dangerous development. If we were to put it in the context of my country, it would mean that British voters, because our Muslim population is only 5%, it would mean that non-Muslim voters cannot vote for Sadiq Khan, who became the mayor of London. It would mean maybe there are voices who could say, Saurang Katurunan Pakistani Baragama Islam, how can he represent the Queen of England? Right? And immediately when you begin to see it in those terms, you realize just how dangerous it is. Because it is to make some of your population second class. So these are the challenges that require vigilance. So in conclusion, in Indonesia, I believe, is a very special country and a country that possesses an incredible future. But it's a future that requires karjakaras. It's a future that requires vigilance and hard work. And it's a future that requires leadership. And whether it is in the area of higher education, whether it is in tackling extremism, whether it is in tackling climate change, or in whatever we do, it's a future that will succeed or fail depending on your ability, your ability as the Ganarasi Emas, to actually be able to communicate with the world. So my message to you is work hard, study hard, take advantage of the opportunities that you have here, but learn English, go abroad, whether it is to study or to travel or to holiday, come to the UK. If you can't come to the UK, I don't mind. Go anywhere you like. Go anywhere you like, because that experience will broaden you. It will teach you about them, but it will also teach you about yourself. And it's through that understanding, that mutual understanding, that we can hope to build a better world for the generations that follow. Thank you. We thank His Excellency, the Honorable Ambassador, for his insightful lecture, and would now like to commence the question and answer session. Please kindly raise your hand to ask a question, and when chosen, briefly introduce yourself before asking the question. Okay. Tafaddo. Yeah. Um, okay, maybe the brother up the back there? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam. Your Excellency, Mr. Ambassador, my name is Akbar, student of International Relations Department of this University of Darussalam Gontor, the fountain of wisdom. I focus on diplomacy and security studies in international relations. We know, actually we know that diplomacy is a part, that education is a part 
of soft diplomacy. A lot of Indonesian people are studying in the UK, whether they are continuing their study in PG, postgraduate, or scholarship from government, chaffening, application, and other. My question is, how can Indonesia government and UK government build a good relation in order to maximize student capability in the term of education? And the second, how can you have been chosen as the first Muslim ambassador in UK government while Muslim in UK as the minority? Thank you. Two or three questions? Yeah, okay. Uh, maybe a question from one of the sisters, please. Yeah. Just raise your hand or stand up to yeah. Like I see. Okay. Okay. Uh, my name is Aza. Uh, I'm on the Department of Nutrition. As a student of health department, I will tell you about the halal food in the UK. How the halal food in the UK? Halal, halal food. Okay, halal food. Okay, thank you. Okay. So the question about maybe the availability of halal food in England. Um, another question, please. Yes, Ustad. Yeah. yeah, yeah. With the blue shirt and tie. Yeah. Yeah, come. Cool. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Thank you for the time. Uh, oh, oh yes. yes, pardon. My name is Khairul Atkia, and I'm a student of education faculty in teaching of Arabic language. Okay, I'm interested in your speech. Just now that, that you say... It's, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm not engaged, engaged in any politics, but I, I like to share my opinion. Uh, you said it's, it's dangerous to people of Indonesia to choose the leader based on their religion. Uh, as, we say, as we see in Jakarta. But uh, I'm testing that you speech after you speech about it will make, it will divide the Indonesian people. There are first grade, second grade, and so on. Uh, we don't treat any ethnic in Indonesia as a second, but some of Indonesian, some of uh, ethnic, we say in Chinese, they have a exclusive life. They match with their own ethnics and they they also have their own community. They don't, they don't mix with us. They don't mix well with us. As you say, in many places in Indonesia, they have their own community. They live with their own life. They, they don't mix with us well. You, you will say you would not see the Chinese people walk in the street of the countryside or in a poor place, they live in their own life. That's my opinion. So my question is, do you have experience with the Chinese people of Indonesia? Or do you, have, do you ever make conversation or discussion with them about their, their opinion of Indonesia or their nationalism? Okay. That's my question. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Walaikum salam. Okay, shukran. Maybe we begin with these three questions, Your Excellency. Thank you. Microphone, please. Yeah. Okay, so I'd ask uh, Paul to just answer the first part of uh, um, relation the others. Jennifer Kess. 
Akbar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pamosa. Um, uh, as I've been kindly introduced, I'm actually the director of what we call the British Council, and it's the British Council, which is that part of Britain overseas, which is most concerned about uh, trying to create good educational relationships and good cultural relationships, good understanding between peoples, uh, in addition to understanding between governments. So your question, Akbar, about how can the UK and uh, Indonesia best collaborate together in education is a very important question for me. And Akbar, you also put it in the context of another phrase. You said soft diplomacy, or I think you were meaning soft power as an international relations uh, student. And that's a very important new concept, new-ish concept in the world. It sounds a bit ominous, soft power, but really what it is saying is that in the world of 2017, power has gone to the people. Whether you live in a democracy or not, the new ways of learning and the new ways of communication means that influence and power is increasingly amongst the people. And therefore, it is more important than ever in our history that the people have good knowledge, the people have the opportunity to learn, the people have a good education. And that is why, really, when we think about the extraordinary potential which Pamozam has spoken of, of Indonesia, maybe becoming the fourth or fifth largest economy in the world in not too long a period of time, when we think of the size of this nation and the diversity of this nation. I would say that there is one essential key to achieving that success. And it's nothing to do with, directly to do with economics or governance or business. It is to do with the education of the people. It is to do with places like this, universities, and also more informal means by which every individual will realize I can make a contribution to the future success of my country and I can also live the most fulfilling life I want by being helped to get the skills, the experience, the inspiration uh, to become educated enough to take command of my own career and vocation. So that is why I think uh, education is critical in terms of a single country. But for us, we then need to, as I said yesterday, as Pamozam said yesterday, we were in Kampung Ingris, and I thought, how extraordinary, I'm in a village uh, at the top of a hill in uh, eastern Java in Indonesia, and yet here I feel the world's language swimming around me. The world is truly a global village these days. We know this phrase, but it's true. And therefore, for the work, we need education for the success of Indonesia to achieve. But we need, in an even bigger way, connected world education for the world truly to operate as a village such that we will collaborate together over our problems. And all problems in, in, in the world today are shared globally. There are very few big problems that cannot be solved by the whole world together getting understanding. And to get understanding means that we have to learn from each other. It's not just a matter of, in our case, because we have, I truly believe, the world's greatest higher education system in the UK. It doesn't mean that we understand and go out and tell everybody else how to do it. It means that we all need to learn together to continue. We can help with the improvement of education systems, but everybody has their own knowledge, their own cultures, and their own experiences. So for me, the greatest thing that a young person can do if they get the opportunity is to do what I did when I was 21 years old, and that is to go and live in another country to learn or study or work for a year or two. I went for two years from Birmingham to India, and I lived for two years in Delhi, and it changed my life. It changed my life because I realized that knowledge is shared around the world and to collaborate in order to solve the world's problems, we need people who understand the world from different points of view. So this is the motivation behind trying to join up our education systems. This is why British Embassy and the British Council wants to cultivate more linkages between the universities and other educational institutions in Britain and in Indonesia. 
It is why we want to increase the number of people from Indonesia who go to study in the UK. It is why we want to increase the number of people in the UK, young people particularly, who come and spend some time, some months, learning about Indonesia and the extraordinary plurality and diversity and positive nature of this wonderful country. Uh, and so we are always seeking new opportunities. Schemes like those we run with our friends at Ristek Dikti and LPDP, um, uh, around scholarships, um, programs, we call it the Newton Fund, named after that great British scientist, Sir Isaac Newton, which enables researchers in the UK and researchers in Indonesia to work together on very important developmental and scientific issues. Lots of schemes, but the purpose behind it all is creating true understanding and trust between our peoples, between our cultures and our countries, because the future, survival, happiness, success of the world depends on that. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So that leaves me with, uh, I think, three questions. Um, let me talk about halal food first, and then I'll come to the two other interesting questions, which I think are connected in some ways. Um, so on halal food, uh, if you are only interested in eating halal food, actually there is no problem in the UK. So we are 5% of the population. There are 3 million Muslims. Um, in every major city of the UK, uh, you will find a Muslim community. You will find a masjid. You will find halal food. Um, so you know, if, if you are only limited to eating halal food, actually there is no real problem. Um, indeed. There's no real hambatan if you want to live as a Muslim in the UK. You know, so if say you want to be Burpuasa, it's okay. If you want to change your, your, your working day, you can tell your boss, I'm going to come late today and I need to leave a, li you know, a little bit later or these are my, my, my fasting hours. And if on Lebaran you want to take a day of leave because you want to go and spend it with your family, well, you can tell them I'm going for leave, it's okay. If you want to take time off on a Friday to go for, to the masjid for Jumatan, almost all employers will say, no problem, please, it's fine. So actually it's very possible to live as a, as a, as a Muslim, as a minority in the UK without any real restriction. The Akbar asked, how is it that I come to be uh, the ambassador of the UK, given that I'm from a minority, right? I think that was your question. And it's a good question, because um, when I was a young person, um, I'm a second generation uh, British national, okay? So my, father, my, my parents moved from Pakistan, originally from India to the UK, and I was born in London, and I grew up in London. There are many like me. Um, but it took a long time for my family, and it took a long time for me to feel like I was a British national. You know, there was a lot of racism in society. There were a lot of confusion in my own head. Am I from this country or that country? There were questions in my mind, can a Muslim person be a British person? But whilst I spent many years trying to work out the answers to those questions. The answer I discovered eventually was that Britain, the United Kingdom today, is a very diverse and a very modern country. So it's a country, you know, where there are people like me and there are people who are 20 different shades of me and there are people like Paul and 20 different shades of Paul. And we're all living side by side. And in our law and in our government, and in our society and our media, we work hard to ensure that the issues that you call Sara, right? Race and religion and ethnicity and so on. We work hard to ensure that those issues do not come to the forefront. I can't promise you that there is no case of racism. There is. Yes, there is some case of Islamophobia. But in our politics and in our economy, and in our government and in our law, we work very hard to try and ensure equality of opportunity for people of all color, all race, all religion, all creeds. And so somebody like me, 
could make that journey from being a minority to finding himself as a civil servant and then eventually being asked, well, maybe you could be an ambassador. And the first time it was suggested to me, I was shocked. I couldn't believe, what? But then you ask yourself, why not? I am a citizen of the country. I have the same rights as everybody else. My face is the face of modern Britain. Right? My face is the face of modern Britain. There are many different faces of modern Britain. But my face is one of those faces. And so in placing me in a country like Indonesia as the ambassador, what we're trying to show, what I hope you see, is where Britain is today as a modern country and where we are going, what our future is. But it connects to your question about the Chinese community. Right? Because as a young person, there would have been many voices in the majority who would have said, that brown-skinned guy over there, he's not from here. He keeps himself in his community. He eats this funny food. He goes and prays in that funny mosque. He's not, a, he's not like us. He's not like us. But they were wrong. They were wrong, right? I can represent the Queen, and I can represent my country, and I can do just as good a job as any one of 20 different shades anywhere else. So society needed to give me a chance. And I needed to take that chance. And the same is true here in Indonesia. So often when I'm asked this question about being a minority and becoming an ambassador, the question I ask is, is it possible in, in your country? Is it possible in Indonesia? Can someone from a minority become the ambassador of Indonesia in London or in Moscow or in Islamabad or wherever else? Can someone from your minorities have an equal chance of becoming a political leader, a minister or a governor, regardless of the issue of race and religion. It's not for me to judge whether the people of Jakarta have made the right choice or the wrong choice. I know Pa Anis. He's a good man, and I believe he will do a good job, and I'm looking forward to working with him. But I also know Pa Ahok. Okay? And I've spent a lot of time talking to him, and I'm sorry to bring these controversial issues into your university. But I know that Pa Ahok is not anti-Muslim. I know that he is not anti-Muslim. I've spent a lot of time with him. Okay. He is not anti-Muslim. And believe me, he's an Indonesian. He's an Indonesian. And all the Indonesian Chinese people that I've met in my two and a half years here, you know, I'm a, I'm a second generation British national. The Indonesian Chinese community, they are all four, five, six, seven, eighth generation. If in two generations I can stand up and say I am British, every Chinese Indonesian person I've ever met, if you ask them, they will say I'm Indonesian. So I think these issues, they occur in society, but they're dangerous. And my hope for Indonesia is that as we go to the elections next year in 2019 and in other settings, that actually religious leaders academic leaders and political leaders will have the courage to stand up and say what matters is your performance, what matters is your policy, what matters is your character and your values, not whether you are from this island or that island or with these eyes or those eyes or this religion or that religion. That is what I understand by Rahmatul Alameen. I think we've got time for maybe another question or two. So raise your hands, please. Yeah, okay, the brother here. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Ali Bahrun. Uh, I'm always a student. Uh, 
but now I'm also uh, a teacher in English in Gontor. First of all, I would like to extend my gratitude and it's an honor for me to finally meet the ambassador of British to Indonesia because uh, I'm frankly said that Gontor and students of Gontor has unleavened with your hometown because our book, English book, is talking about London. I cannot imagine that every time I read this English book, I arrive at Waterloo Station, pass on Westminster Bridge, looking at the House of Parliament, Westminster Abbey, so staying at the Grasvenor Hotel, and, and it's not all, but how I pass the mall, looking at the Admiralty Arts, arriving at the Nelson Column and the Trafalgar Square, at the British Museum, everything. And beside that, I always wonder when I could visit London Zoo to finally see the eagles in this bridge. And it is a matter of time, sir, because it's not only about London, Oxford becomes our guidance in English because Advanced Oxford Dictionary is my companion for more than 14 years studying in Gondor. So I would like to appreciate that, sir, and thank you so much. And finally, my question is, uh, you said that Indonesia become the important parts of the world, but willingly, we find that the creation, I mean like, let's say the authors, the singers, the musicians, the scholars from Indonesia is not warmly welcome to the world. The question is, what is the challenge or what is the real challenge that we are facing now? And the second, what is the less of preparation? Because sometimes we have already prepared everything. The education, the quality of the education has always been raised at most than 2.5 billion, no more than no a trillion spent by our government to improve this quality of education. But when we go abroad, we go to the world, become the people of the world, there always something tackles us. What is actually the challenge? And as a Muslim generation, especially Pesantren, because Pesantren is the indigenous culture of Indonesia that cannot be found anywhere except in Indonesia. That's why, what must we do actually? What must we do to become the part of the world? Not only asking help of people. I think that's all my questions, sir. And I, have, uh, I wish you could have an enjoyable visit to University of Darussalam and also Gontor next time. Thank you. Sister with the brown hijab. Okay, thank you. My name is Dian. I'm a lecturer of health faculty. Uh, okay. I found an article. It said that a number of studies found that Muslims are discriminated to apply for a job, especially in Britain. For example, uh, Princeton University researchers found that Muslims are much as about 60% less likely to get a job offer than a Christian. Is that true? And what do you say about that, sir? Thank you. That's my question. Okay. Yeah. So, um, uh, let me start with the last question first um, and discrimination because it continues the theme that we were raising earlier. So in every country around the world, in every country around the world, the truth is that minorities have to fight for their rights. It's true in Indonesia. It was true in the US. It's true in South Africa. It's true in every country in the world. It's true in the UK. So Muslims are a minority in the UK. We are 5% of the population. 
but in London, we are 10%. In Birmingham, we are 30%. And you see examples of great success, but you also see struggles. So you can see somebody like me who ends up as the ambassador. You can see someone like Sadiq Khan who becomes the mayor of London. Yeah, the mayor of London, the mayor of maybe the most international city in the world. But equally, there are cases where not just actually people of Muslim background, but people you know from, uh, from the Afro-Caribbean region or other parts of the world have experienced discrimination. But compared to other countries, Compared to other countries, whether in Europe or elsewhere, I believe that the UK is in fact doing very, very well. So we are not perfect, right? We are not perfect. There is still work to be done in the UK. Right? We, the struggle continues for, for, for rights and for recognition and for equality of opportunity. But I would not want you to take away the message that we cannot succeed. Okay, in our civil service, in our politics, in our government, in our business leadership, you will find people of all religions and of all colors who are succeeding and doing well, women and men. And so I believe we have a lot that we can share with the world in terms of our success uh, in these areas. On um, the other questions, um, So education and creative industries were two questions uh, that you raised. I think education we've talked about at some length. And I think my, my top point about education quality is that Indonesia does need to improve quality and it needs to do it quickly. And I believe there are two critical issues to raise quality. One is English language, because if you have English language, you don't have to translate the world's academic learning into Bahasa Indonesia. You can get it straight. It means you can watch the podcast. You can watch the YouTube video by the professor. It means you can invite a professor to come here. right? So you can get the knowledge directly. That's one thing. Learn Bahasa English. And the second thing is build international relationships. Because you could spend the next 20 or 30 years working on your own to raise quality. But actually, if you can build a joint degree with, a, with, a, with another in, uh, international institution that's doing well in your area, if you can have uh, joint research with a foreign professor, if you can invite a professor to come and give lectures here, that can accelerate your journey. It can mamparchapat process peningkatan kualitas penedikan so those would be my two top things. And on creative industries, your, your observation is very right. At the moment, the world does not know enough about Indonesia. So your musicians, your filmmakers, and others, jarang, ah, that they are able to operate on the international level. But with Paul, we are working on this. So for some years now, for example, uh, the British Council has been working with Indonesian fashion designers including uh, modest wear, uh, so Dian Palangi and others who have become famous in that area. And they are people who are very talented, but what they lack is knowledge of the international market and how to harness their talent, to use their talent to create products for the international market. So after a period of three or four years, including visits to London Fashion School and exchanges and collaboration, one year ago, the leading fashion store in the leading fashion street of London in New Bond Street had a showcase on Indonesia. And we, took, and we took five Indonesian designers and they showed their products in Fennec department store and they achieved their one month sales target in one week. And we took President Jokowi there we took President Jokowi there to the store and he met the designers. And he was so inspired because he said that when, before his career in politics, as a furniture maker, as a furniture maker, his dream was to create furniture that could compete in Paris. So when he saw the journey of these young fashion designers, this one was not something that connected with his head. 
connected with his heart. And so he could see why the work that we're doing in the British Council, in that case with, with, with fashion, but increasingly with music, potentially with film and other areas of creative industries, this is a very important part of helping Indonesia find its place in the world and to tell the world about Indonesia. And on London, you made me homesick. So you were describing my hometown. I'm a born and bred Londoner. I grew up in London. And you also mentioned my second city, Oxford, because my wife is from Oxford. And uh, I did my S Dua in Oxford. And my son has just finished his S Satu in Oxford. So it's really a, a second hometown uh, for me. But on London, I have to tell you, it, it is the greatest city in the world. It is the greatest city in the world. 25% of the people do not have white skin. They're from all over the world. You can eat any food you like from anywhere in the world. You will hear any language you want to hear on the streets of London. You will meet the world in London. It is the one city, and I've been to many of the cities of the world, even compared to New York and, and Paris and so on. It is the one city in the world that has the greatest right to describe itself as a world city. It really is genuinely a great city. It has incredible higher education. It has incredible talent and creativity. And it has incredible industries. So if you ever get the chance, come to the UK, visit London, get out of London too, because if you go to Oxford, you will see a university that is hundreds of years old. But also go to the countryside and meet the people. And whether you go for study, whether you go for holiday, whether you go for Jalan Jalan Saja, um, those experiences that you have will be very important to your future. Because, you know, Paul said he went to India. At the age of 18, I went to the US, to Boston, for Jalan Jalan Saja. And when I went to Boston, I was coming from the country where the people look the same and they speak the same language and they eat kind of the same food. But what I found was that the Americans laughed about things that I didn't understand. And things that made me laugh, they didn't understand. We were different. We were different. And so when you travel, you learn something about them, but you learn something about yourself. And it's that learning about each other that builds the foundations for us to be able to actually work together and to solve our problems together. Which is why my motto for my time in Indonesia is Bakarja Barsama, Barhasil Barsama. So, Satagali Lagi, Trima Kasi Banya. It's been a pleasure to talk to you and to meet the talented students of Universitas Dar es Salaam. And uh, inshallah, I look forward to having the opportunity again someday. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our question and answer session. We thank His Excellency, the Ambassador, and would now like to invite the Rector of University of Jerusalem Gonto, Dr. Professor Dr. Mal Fatullah Zakashi MA, for the presentation of a souvenir to the Honorable Ambassador as a token of our sincere appreciation. We would now like to invite the Honorable Dr. Hidayatullah Zakashi for the reading of the dua. Yeah. Please.
الفاتحة اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد وسلم رضي الله تعالى عن كل الصحابه رسول الله اجمعين والحمد لله رب العالمين حمدا يوافي النعم يكافي مزيده يا ربنا لك الحمد كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك الكريم وعظيم السلطان اللهم انت ربنا لا اله الا انت خلقتنا ونحن عبادك ونحن على عهدك وعهدك ما استطعنا نعوذ بك من شر ما صنعنا نبو لك بنعمتك علينا ونبو بذنوبنا فاغفر لنا فإنه لا يغفر الذنوب إلا أنت ربنا اغفر لنا ولوالدينا وارحمهما كما ربيانا صغارا اللهم ربنا اغفر لنا ذنوبنا وكفر عنا السيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار اللهم سهل أمورنا ويسر أعمالنا وحقق آمالنا في الجهاد التربوي وبارك لنا في كفاحنا ووفقنا يا الله كما تحب وترضى يا الله بركناه كقوات لاهر dan batin terutama kepada ambassador madam malik ya Allah Berikanlah kekuatan kepada beliau agar tetap istiqomah untuk menjadi muslim sejati di manapun beliau ditugaskan maka Islam akan jaya di sana ya Allah wala haula wala quwata illa bika Allah Berikanlah kekuatan lahir dan batin dalam membantu tugas beliau ya Allah dan jadikanlah beliau tetap menjadi figur menjadi figur muslim yang baik di negaranya Allah ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بك الله اللهم أعنا على ذكرك وشكرك وحسن بالدي اللهم سلمنا وسلمه من آفات الدنيا ذاب الآخرة وفدنتهما وبليتهما وفضيحتهما إنك على كل شيء قدير سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, as the saying goes, all good things come to an end. So we'd like to end today's agenda by expressing our sincere appreciation to His Excellency and also to the Honourable Paul Smith and all our gratitude to all participants here today. And we'll finish today's agenda by reciting Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. Maybe now, maybe Taswir as well, photos at the end. Yeah, inshallah. Sure. Oh yeah.